Hey, what's up guys and welcome back to the channel. I was recently working and I was getting asked uh, via DMs on Instagram how to install Square Edge baseboard and how that differs versus a typical Cope baseboard installation. In this video I'm just going to bring you alongside me and show you how I go about my installation. Hopefully you can get some pro tips and tricks and maybe add something to your workflow that will make you faster and more effective. So my first piece of advice always use a headlamp it's the most handy tool you can have for working in dark places in new construction homes there's never any lighting installed so you're going to go into a lot of dark rooms and dark closets the headlamp makes life a lot easier next tip is going to be on cutlass i always have two cutlass in play one is always clipped to my holder on the saw the other is in my tool belt Whenever I walk up to the saw to start cutting a new cut list, I'll take the cut list that's already clipped at the saw and put that back in my nail pouch. The reason for this is it's really easy to forget your cut list at the saw all the time. Having two eliminates that problem. I like these little notepads and I've got them listed in my Amazon store under consumables, I believe. I like to draw a nice straight line splitting the page in half and then number it off. It gives you about 36 pieces, so I'll take uh, measurements and fill out that whole page, cut every piece, move them to wherever they go, start over and do it again. 36 pieces is a pretty good amount. It, doing any more pieces than that and it can just get kind of confusing. The number on the cut list is going to get written on the wall where the baseboard goes and then it's also going to get written on the back of the piece of baseboard and that's going to help me keep track of where all these pieces go. Let's talk tool belt setup. First thing you're going to have is gauge blocks. These keep the baseboard up off the floor. Uh, next thing is going to be your gauge block. Same thickness as the base for measuring base. Stud finder. Love that Franklin. Leica Disto D2 laser. Best one out there. We've got my brad nails back here, inch and a half, 18 gauge, my cut list, or my 15 gauge nails, and then my cut list is tucked back in here. Other side, got my rubber mallet, that way I can beat things into subjection. Glue, glue bot, sandpaper, 120 grit. My pry bar, this is the best pry bar for baseboard. and stiletto 10 ounce hammer which also is needed at times shameless plug here easiest way to support the channel is to utilize the links that are in the video notes or go to my amazon store where i have lists of the tools that you'll see me using here on these videos uh, it's a great resource for finding really great tools that will help make you money and be more efficient here you see my laser the Leica Disto 2. Highly recommend it. I've had a couple of them that I've broken due to my own neglect over the years, but they hold up great and are extremely accurate. Pretty much a necessity for any kind of trim work. So let's go over how to measure an entire floor of baseboard accurately whenever it's a square profile. You'll see here, this is a square edge five and a quarter um, baseboard, eased edge on top, it's got relief uh, cut on the back. So typically with baseboard you would always be measuring from corner to corner and you would be coping the baseboard. But whenever you have a square profile like this you don't want to do that. Well you can't do that because you're not mitering it. So I was actually just talking to a, a carpenter today who's asking me some questions on how to install this so i'll show you my workflow and how i do it the first thing and what's going to seem most obvious is that you can't measure corner to corner with this type of baseboard unless you're going to miter it or cope it in my opinion this does not need coped so we're going to be square butting everything together which means you always need a small block in your bag of baseboard that matches the thickness so what you're then going to do is you're going to take your baseboard and you're going to use that as an offset block whenever you're getting your measurements. So turning you around, right here for example, uh, I've got this piece starting out and we're going to go around the room like so. 
my first measurement, this piece is going to need to go all the way through to the wall, which it does. Now on my next piece, I need to subtract the thickness of this baseboard. So as I'm going around measuring the room, what I'm doing is using that block and shooting my laser down there and that gives me my measurements. So it's super easy. You just, as you go around the room, I take that measurement, then I would actually move to this corner and I would actually be shooting from here that way. Same thing, I'd move down here and then I'd shoot that way, so on and so forth. Now something I like to do, you're gonna have this situation throughout the entire house where the door is off of a wall and you have a narrow piece of baseboard. Personally, I always take my long piece and run that through and then I install the small piece like so. The reason for that is if you install that this narrow piece first, the taper on the bottom of that piece of drywall is going to want to let this piece kick, the small piece kick in, and it's going to be really hard to deal with that. And what would happen is you would end up with a gap right here. Whereas if you installed this piece first, then this piece, if it's kicked in on the bottom a little bit, it's not a big deal because you're riding up against here so it's going to be nice and tight. Whenever it comes to measuring outside corners, if you're measuring and you're looking at it from this angle, you're not going to be able to see the tape very clearly. So to get uh, a good eye on it, you actually want to move around here and look at it straight in line with that wall and it's going to be a lot easier to see what your measurement is versus if you're way out here trying to look at it at an angle. I've got this uh, upstairs done and I actually cut the main level uh, base of base this morning. You see some pieces laying around so that's not nailed on yet so let's go down there now and I'll show you some things there. So you'll notice here I've got pieces laying everywhere and you'll notice with each piece there's a number written on the wall and it corresponds with the number I write on the back of these pieces whenever I'm cutting them at the saw. That way it's easy to keep track of the pieces and get them where they need to go. For me personally I like to cut an entire level at a time. Usually that's about three pieces of paper on the cut list so usually 100 to 150 pieces of baseboard. I'll scatter those to where they all need to go and then I'll strap up my knee pads and nail them all off at the same time. If you're an apprentice wondering how accurate you should be measuring baseboard, I think you should be around 95 to 100% accuracy rate, meaning if you're cutting 100 pieces, 95 of them should be correct at minimum. Typically for me, I'm usually having two or three recuts per floor. For whatever reason, it's hard to reach that perfect mark, but usually I have a brain fart on one or two pieces where I add an inch or something dumb and have to go back and recut those, but you should be able to get almost every single piece right. So you notice over here, this wall and this wall are over 16 feet long. So when that happens, I biscuit uh, a splice in the center, butt join it, cut it a little bit long and snap it together. With a long wall like this, let's just say it was 249 inches. What I do there is I'll just cut one piece at 100 inches, subtract that off at 249, then my next piece is 149 inches. Or if it was 145 and 7 eighths, I could cut and I had a 100 inch piece laying around, I cut it at 100 inches and then cut the remaining on the next piece, biscuit the two ends, and it's really simple. Uh, and that way you're not losing your workflow running back and forth 
to a wall, cutting one piece and then taking the measurement on the next piece. It's real easy. Just take the long measurement with your laser and then cut both pieces at the saw just like you do the rest of the pieces. Tell you one tool that's an absolute must have uh, for baseboard is this particular flat bar. Uh, this one always lives in my bags. It's got a very narrow end and it works great as a scraper, but then also this thin hook on the end works great to hook in under the baseboard and pry it. So if you've got a, a gap at the bottom of your joint, it's really easy to pry it back out and then scissor nail it and that'll give you a tight joint. Lately I've been just walking around and cleaning all the drywall mud off that would hinder baseboard installation in advance. That way as I'm installing I don't run into problems. I'll just take care of it all at once. When you're installing you've got to always have your eye looking out ahead to watch for globs of mud otherwise you can really just run into annoying issues as you try and nail things off. Things won't want to fit together tightly so it's good just to get things cleared off. If anyone's wondering as far as nails go for baseboard I like to use inch and a half 18 gauge brads to nail my outside corners and then any small pieces that might split with a larger nail. And then for the rest, I use 15 gauge, two inch long is typical for five eighths baseboard. And then I'll just load those up in my tool belt and go to town. One of the tools I'm most passionate about is these pro knees knee pads. They are absolutely amazing for weight distribution on your knees. I'm 31 and I didn't do a good job of taking care of my knees earlier on in my career. So I definitely feel it in my knees and these knee pads are absolutely amazing. They really take the pressure off your kneecaps and distribute it across your shin bone. Great product, I'd highly recommend it. Any young guys out there watching, take a word of advice from me and take care of your knees. If you don't, you're not invincible and you will fill it eventually. Now it's time to nail off. I know there's a lot of fancy nail guns out there. I've used some of them and I still love my simple and cheap Bostitch and Hitachi. These have been great for me and I've got no complaints. I also highly recommend installing these hooks on all your nailers. Makes it really easy whenever you need both sets of hands and the gun nearby. In my area, we install flooring after baseboard, so I have to reference the print and see what flooring goes in which rooms, and then keep the baseboard up at the proper height. So for carpet, it stays up 3 8 and then for hard surface flooring, I want to be 1 8 inch above whatever the hard surface is. I always rip some scrap spacer blocks. Uh, just out of scrap material laying around on site and then I'll use that in the corners to keep the base up off the floor at the proper height. So here you see me I'm just going around the room start with one piece move on snap the next piece in so on and so forth. Usually I'll try and get all the pieces snapped together and then nail them off all together at once. Here you see the necessity of the rubber mallet. You're going to have to bang on the wood to get it where you want it to go if you're installing things tight. If you do that with a steel hammer, you won't see it on raw wood, but you're putting dents everywhere in the wood that'll show up after it's painted. So the rubber mallet is really a must for baseboard installation. Whenever you're installing baseboard, you have to be really careful with the pieces that you're installing that will butt up against door casing. The reason is if it's too tight and you really force it into place, it'll push that casing inwards and it'll close the margins on your doors. So whenever I measure my pieces, I don't add anything for those pieces that butt into door casing. I want them to be exact, that way it doesn't mess with my door margins. Personally for me, nailing off baseboard is probably the thing I hate more than anything whenever it comes to trimming houses. That's why I usually try to get, at frame, get in at framing stage before drywall and actually spray marks on the floor where all my studs go. That way I don't have to be trying to find studs with a stud finder or laying my tape on the floor to show me where I need to nail. Um, I definitely just flat out hate nailing off baseboard. This Franklin style stud finder is definitely by far my favorite. I'd highly recommend that to anybody. 
it helps you see the bigger picture not just where one stud is but you can also tell whenever you've got multiple studs packaged together so on and so forth so highly recommend it but definitely the best thing ever for nailing off baseboard is getting in before drywall and marking everything on the floor the, the other advantage to that is also you can mark water lines and other trouble spots to ensure that you're not accidentally going to put a nail into something that you shouldn't. These days there's a lot of hardwood being put into new homes and one nice thing to do whenever you're nailing off baseboard is try and keep your bottom nail low enough that the shoe molding will cover it. It's just one less nail hole then that could possibly show up and be visible after paint. Usually for short runs of baseboard, I'll just use my stud finder, but for longer runs, I like to lay out my tape measure on the floor and then just use the red marks to go every 16 inches and put a nail where it needs to go. One pro tip I would have for finding studs is use your eyes. Drywallers are not very good a lot of times, and a lot of times you can actually see some maybe nail pops or you can see the mud where a nail has been spotted. The other thing to look for is electrical outlets. It's easy to look at an electrical box and you can tell which side of that box the stud is on by the tabs on the side of the box. So that's another thing to keep in mind, especially whenever you're laying your tape on the floor for a long run. I'll look for electrical boxes. I'll look for the stud, whichever side it's on, and then I'll lay my tape on the floor accordingly with that, and that usually works pretty good. And then there are the joys of shooting a nail right across the top of the baseboard when you get carried away. Uh, pretty easy to set one like this. The worst are the ones that graze the top of the baseboard and mess up the, uh, the wood and splinter it off. So thankfully this wasn't a very big deal, but always good to take your time and not do dumb stuff. Drywall is somewhat fluid. If you've got a piece that's a little bit long, pull it back and give it a hard push and that'll actually maybe uh, clear the mud out of the way or dent the drywall a little bit and it'll fit. I like to cut all my baseboard outside corners at 46 degrees. That seems to work well for keeping the outside corner closed. Occasionally they still open up and in that case I'll use a steel object to burnish the edge and then sand it a little bit and you're good to go. The most common question I get regarding this type of baseboard profile is Typically the front edge of that baseboard has got a round over on it, usually a 532nd, and people ask if they're supposed to cope that or not. For me, the answer is no. I remember going back years ago to one of my first houses that I trimmed as a subcontractor. I took the job and I thought I had to live up to this insanely high level of carpentry. At that point in my career, I was extremely naive about the level of quality that was actually going into the work in the trim subcontracting industry. I learned as I watched more and more carpenters that there was a lot of subpar work going on, but I also came to realize that I didn't have a good understanding of what real value actually is. As a trim subcontractor, I've got to value engineer the job, meaning I've got to find the way that is gonna be the fastest and most effective while giving the most quality on the installation of any given product. So on a piece of baseboard like this, there's no added value to me in coping one eighth inch radius on baseboard that's not gonna be discernible. Same thing with a jack miter. There just isn't a discernible difference and people don't notice that kind of detail. So it's better for me to put that labor into something else that's gonna give the client something that they actually want. Going back to that house years ago where I was first introduced to this baseboard profile, the baseboard profile going in that house was this same profile. So I thought I had to get real fancy with it and do a jack miter that way that that top edge of that baseboard had a miter on the inside corner. So I was doing the main level and the upper level of the house. Meanwhile, an old school carpenter showed up to do the basement because it was a large home and he was just butting everything together. At that time, he understood value a whole lot better than I did. In trim subcontracting, if you're doing something and it's not adding real tangible value, that means you're costing yourself money or you're, or you're costing the client money. That takes 
uh, details away from them that they could have had because you're using labor on something that isn't necessary. So in my opinion, coping that little round over is completely unnecessary. I've done miles and miles of this baseboard and no one has ever said anything about butt joints and the rest of my industry in the city. People are installing it this way too. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to hit the like button and drop me a comment down in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Any improvements I can make on the video, questions, comments on things that you do differently or things that I can improve on. I'm always open to suggestions. So until next time, we'll see you in the next video.